Okay, we're going to get underway. We're, we're having trouble this evening with the videography, so the recording is not going to be at the same level that we've had in the past, and we're probably going to have a difficult time trying to pick up questions with the uh, microphone, because that is not working either. So, if you have questions, I'll repeat the question, and we'll go from there. Okay? I want to want to begin tonight, before we get into the main lesson, and just sort of briefly, briefly recap where we've been to get you to the point of where we're headed to this evening. After the first lesson, which was introductory material, we moved into lesson two, and I introduced you to startling text in the Old Testament, Psalm 82, Psalm 89, where we have clear indication of the scripture indicating that there are these beings, these sons of God, that are actually in scripture referred to as lesser Elohim. Elohim is the main word that's used in the Old Testament general word for God. It's not the personal name, but it is the, the general. We looked at Psalm 82, we looked at Psalm 89 in that regard. Then we moved into lesson three, and we looked at various scenarios of the divine council meeting, that God has this council. The council's made up of the sons of God, and they are involved in decision-making, even though God is the one who does everything that happens. These beings are in no way at the same level as the God that we worship on Sunday morning. They are lesser in all respects. But Moses refers to them continually as gods. Next, we moved into the idea that the sons of God are actually also in the image of God. And we noted there that as we image God to the created world, they image God to the unseen world. Both realms, we have the same idea. And I tried to build the case there that what other image could they possibly be made in? Especially when we have the scripture indicating for us being restored to where Adam was, Paul says in both Colossians and in also Ephesians that we are being restored in righteousness, holiness, and truth. I think these beings have that. But as we noted last week, we began focusing on the Lord of Darkness. I shared with you a couple of texts that indicate that the sons of God are corruptible. And that's really the backdrop of Psalm 82. I didn't really expound on Psalm 82 for you as far as what was going on there. We will, probably next year, we will reach that point. But what I was calling to your attention was these beings do exist. But in that text, God is excoriating these sons of God for various kinds of things that they had been a part of. And we noted last week that in uh, two, two comments that's made by Eliphaz in the book of Job, where he's going back and forth with Job regarding counsel and various things concerning Job's situation. He's in a bad state because of everything that's happening. He's not aware of what's going on behind the scenes. Eliphaz makes the comment that God puts no trust in his holy ones. The point being that they, are, they have the risk of corruptibility. I see that in the same way in regards to Adam. Now we know in our cases, we are born in corruption because Adam served as the federal head of the race. Whatever he did not only affected him, but it affected his prodigy as well. So we're all affected by that. But these beings, they don't have any federal head. They're all independently made. We don't have any information on that. And yet, they are corruptible, as was Adam. Unlike us, Adam had no predisposition towards not believing the word of God that was given to him. But he and Eve believed Satan's word over God's word, and we have the situation that we're in today. We spent the rest of that lecture talking about the Lord of Darkness, how the serpent, in Genesis chapter 3, there's an evolutionary process there by the time we get to the New Testament that he is identified as Satan and everything that goes with that. So that brings us to where we are at this point in time. Let me begin this way in regards to tonight's lecture. 
The book of Genesis is, is neatly divided into two sections. They're not 50-50, but there is a divide there. It's chapter 1 through 11, which is what we call primeval history. In a later lecture, I'll actually have a PowerPoint for you on this. The second section is called the patriarchal history, which begins in chapter 12 and runs all the way to chapter 50. You note that in chapter 12, everything focuses on Abraham. He comes up out of nowhere, and then it's all about those patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. That's the rest of the whole book. Our focus is going to be on chapters 1 through 11, this primeval history. And what I will be doing throughout the remainder of this course is making the argument that what you have in that primeval history, chapter 1 through 11, are three separate rebellions. Now, one of them you're very familiar with, Genesis chapter 3. I mean, it's part of the story of the scripture where Adam sins, obviously, and then we have the hope of the redemption coming, and the whole Bible was about that. But that was precipitated by a divine rebellion. It's the serpent who foments that. If you remember, he questions God's word. He kind of leads Eve into a situation that really God doesn't have your best interests at heart. He's put this stipulation on you, and if you would go this direction, it's better, it's, you're in your better interests. That we're very familiar with. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. I have taught on that. I've preached on that. We've covered that in many different ways and times over the years. But tonight we're going to be looking at the second rebellion, which occurs in chapter 6. The third rebellion will take place in chapters 10 and 11, but that won't be until part 2 of this class, which will begin in March when we get there. But we're going to be focused on chapter 6, 1 through 4. The key point that I'd like you to remember, and you'll see it on the screen here, is that each of these occurrences of expanding human depravity was precipitated by an earlier divine rebellion. The powers of darkness fomo, foment human sin and rebellion against God. Man is culpable for his sin. Man is responsible for all of the decisions that he makes. But there is a party that's in and behind the scenes that foment this. Same thing, if you want a picture of that, just look at that discussion that ensues in that first rebellion with Eve and the serpent. Now that leads us to what is arguably the most perplexing and controversial passages in the whole of the Bible. If it's not the most, it's got to be right there among the top three. We'll pick it up at chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. Now it came about... When men began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he is also is of flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore them children. Those were the mighty men of old, men of renown. Now, if you have your Bible tonight, you might want to keep that text open, because we'll be referring to it a great deal. Let's deal with the easiest part of this text, I think, is... Verse 3, question of the 120 years. Some have suggested that this was a new limit on man's lifespan since the fall. But that doesn't fit because many people live long lives after the flood. For example, Shem lived 600 years and there are many others that live for hundreds of years. I think the key point here is made by Tim Chaffee on this, and I think he caught this well, that the Bible does not record, record genealogy information from Adam down to Moses. 
It does, excuse me. The Bible does record genealogy information from Adam down to Moses. But as soon as the lifespans decreased to 120 years, then the Bible stopped recording how old a person was when he died. It is as if Moses showed the fulfillment of Genesis 6-3 by listing all the ages, but as soon as that passage was fulfilled, there's no longer any record of ages. It's very interesting. So I think that's why that is in there. But that leads us to this other part, which is the vexing part of this text. Who are the sons of God? Now, with what you've been taught thus far, okay, this is week six, you've had seven and a half hours of destruction up to this point. The clearest reading of this is, these are the individuals that we've been talking about. But that's very controversial. And added to that is the controversy of, who are the Nephilim? Who are these guys? What is this all about? Now, in approaching this text, there are three understandings of it, three interpretations of it. Two of them are what I would categorize as a naturalistic explanation, and the third is a supernatural explanation. So right now, all I want to do is introduce to you these various views, and then the second half of the lecture, I'll critique um, natural view number one and natural view number two. Okay? Natural view number one, we're asking, who are these sons of God? Well, this view asserts that the sons of God were nobles. They were aristocrats and princes who married young women outside of their social status and took large numbers of females into their harems. Umberto Casuto, who is a Jewish scholar, he asserts this in a commentary back in 1973. This is generally the, the Jewish view of this text. <clears throat> it was altered by Meredith Klein later on in the Theological Journal, the Westminster Theological Journal in 1962. Meredith Klein has quite a track record as far as uh, his teaching ability. He taught at Gordon-Conwell, he taught at Westminster East, he taught at Westminster West, he also taught at Reformed Theological Seminary where I eventually graduated from. <clears throat> Klein, it is understood, broke new ground on this. He modified the sons of God to mean divine kings. And in his view, these tyrants are a continuation of the cursed line of Cain, who were supposed to administer justice, but instead claimed for themselves deity and violating the divine order by forming royal harems and perverted their mandate to rule the earth under God in justice. This is also this ancient Jewish view. Now, when I say ancient, I want you to understand, I'm talking the, the 100 and to 200 years after the time of Christ. This is the dominant view in Judaism up to the present. The second view, the second naturalistic view, is known as the Sethite position or the Sethite view. In this view, the sons of God were choosing inappropriate marriage partners spiritually corrupt women. Sorry, ladies, it's always your fault. <laughs> this, in turn, led to a blurring of the godly and ungodly lines. Now, let me back up a little bit here so you understand this. So, you have Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve are ejected from the garden. The very next chapter, we have the first murder. Cain kills Abel, right? Cain is, does not, is not involved in a death penalty for this. God has a moratorium on murderers in the first degree. He has a mark that's put on him so no one else would do anything to him. And a, a son is given to Adam and Eve to replace Abel, that being Seth. 
Now, when you follow chapter 4 out, chapter 4 largely is about the lineage of Cain. When you get to chapter 5, it's largely about the lineage of Seth. Cain would be the ungodly line. It is argued that this view fits the context of Genesis because of the earlier notations concerning the ungodly line of Cain in chapter 4 and the godly line in chapter 5. The result here led to a decrease in godly influence and thus an increase in corruption and violence. Intermarriage with unbelievers is a serious problem, writes Richard Belcher in his commentary. It was a serious problem that Israel faced when they went into the land of Canaan, Deuteronomy 7, and as they returned from exile in Babylon, Ezra chapter 9 and Nehemiah 13. So that's the idea here is that somehow in the Sethite view, the godly line, this lineage that was coming down through Seth, becomes corrupted with this other line of Cain. And this corporately leads to a, a situation that's impossible, and then we have the result being the flood. Naturalistic view one and two. Now here's the supernatural view. The supernatural view is that the designation sons of God indicates divine, godlike beings, lesser gods, not simply angels, although some commentators will use that word. I've been trying to make the case thus far that angels, at least in the Old Testament context, are, they're in the same realm, but they seem to be individuals that are given a lesser task. These sons of God are talked about in regards to the divine counsel, their higher order of being. It seems that way. The indication here would be in the supernatural view, these sons of God, some of them, engaged in sexual relations with human females with the result of spawning the Nephilim, which is, in fact, a race of giants. The actual title, Sons of God, is used in the earliest Old Testament book. I tried to make the case for that in regards to the book of Job. To refer to these divine beings who are part of God's divine counsel. Scholars generally believe that Job lived around the time of Abraham, give or take a couple centuries. The events of Job predate the writing of Moses. Now remember, Moses is writing about something very much early, earlier, but he's writing at a later date. Consequently, it establishes a precedent for how the Hebrew Benai Elohim, sons of God, were identified by the people of that time and place. The book probably did not reach its completed state until well after the time of Solomon. You've got it on the screen here, several texts. We've already looked at these out of the book of Job. This is review. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Chapter 1, verse 6. Again, chapter 2, verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. This is a divine counsel. This is what we talked about. And of course, Job 38, verse 7, this is at the end of the book when God is speaking directly to Job and he overwhelms him with the grand nature of his own being and the fact that he created everything here. And we have the text regarding the universe being made that when this took place, verse 7, the morning stars sang together, a reference again, we looked at this, stars referencing the sons of God, and then we have it, the latter part of the verse, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. They were present at creation. This predates the creation of man and woman. This leads Leon Morris in his commentary in Genesis to be not ambiguous in the least. There is no doubt at all, he writes, in these passages in Job, the meaning applies exclusively to these angelic beings. A very similar form of Bar Elohim is used in Daniel 3.25, we'll look at this in a moment, and also refers to either an angel or a theophany, that would be an appearance of God. 
The term sons of the mighty, Benai Elohim, is used in Psalm 29, 1, and also Psalm 89, verse 6, and again it refers to these angels. You'll see it on the screen. Daniel chapter 3, verse 25, he said, Look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of of the gods. That terminology is very similar to the same language that we have being used in Job. Psalm 29 verse 1, ascribe to the Lord, O sons of the mighty. Again, a little different, but very, very similar. Psalm 89 verse 6, for, the sky, for who in the skies is comparable to the Lord, who among the sons of the mighty is like the Lord. This is also a great text to show that Yahweh is above, beyond, in his own realm, above the sons of God. Now, Calvin absolutely detested this view. Okay? John Calvin writes about this regarding the supernatural view, quoting, he says, that the ancient figment concerning the intercourse of angels with women is abundantly refuted by its own absurdity. And it is surprising that learned men should formerly have been fascinated by ravings so gross and prodigious, end quote. Think he had disdain for it? Unfortunately, Calvin didn't offer a serious critique of the text. He just wrote it off because it was absurd. And that's part of the problem with interpreting this text. It does sound absurd. It sounds like you're in the supermarket and you just caught a glimpse of the National Enquirer. Front page, some screwball story about demons coming down out of the sky and copulating with women. Calvin didn't interact with the text. Calvin did not have the benefit of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Calvin did not have most of the pseudepigrapha that I talked to you about last week. It wasn't available at the time. But nonetheless, that view is the larger view regarding this text. The widely respected Cowan Didledge commentary, I used to have that when I still had my office, I don't any longer. Old Testament commentary, very old, very respected, very big on understanding the Hebrew. It says, in regards to the supernatural view, quote, it is not warranted by the usage of the language, end quote. John Curran, who was my Old Testament prof, one of them, he represents modern commentators who reject the supernatural view. He states, there is no supporting biblical data indicating that angels or heavenly beings either marry or have generative powers. In fact, a close reading of the text nowhere concludes that the Nephilim are the fruit of these marriages in question. All scripture references used to identify the sons of God with heavenly beings come from outside of the Pentateuch, and such an appearance of heavenly beings would come out of the blue." End quote. Well, that's true. I mean, because he's confining his commentary there to the Pentateuch, which is the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So he's not taking into account Psalms. He's not taking into account um, Job and some of these other passages or places where we see these glimpses going on. So that's the introduction. There's only three ways you're going to go on this text. And this is almost like in some ways, I think this is why politicians hate abortion. They don't want to take a stand on it, a lot of them. And it, it's hard to not take a stand. You can't be kind of against abortion, you know, or you're kind of pro-choice. I mean, it, you, it's one of these situations you've got to make a stand. You've got to make a position on it. Well, here we are. Who are these sons of God? What is going on here? What is this all about? So let me analyze, first of all, the natural view, number one, the aristocracy of kings. 
The heart of this view is to understand that the sons of God as human kings who were thought to be divine by ancient people groups. What they do with this is very interesting. I began the second lesson of this class with Psalm 82, Psalm 89. I made the case there that Psalm 82, this is not talking about human beings. <laughs> this is talking about supernatural beings. They are called gods. They are cursed by God. God says to them, you're gonna die the death of men. If they were men, they would have died that way anyway. But they take the position that Psalm 82 is actually about human divine kings. They take that position and then they read that back into Genesis chapter 6, 1 to 4. They argue here that God refers to humans as his children. Israel is God's son, and they support this with their view, and then the marriages in question would then speak of the practice of polygamy on the part of these kings. Meredith Klein, I mentioned earlier, he asserts this heavily, but a guy like, for example, John Gill, a Puritan, 1697 to 1771, states something very similar. Quote, rather civil magistrates are meant the rulers and judges of the people who by this name Elohim or gods in Exodus are so called because of the powers ordained by God in them, but they are human. Okay, that's the position of that point. But let's look at it again. I'm gonna bring you back to Psalm 82. You see it on the screen, verse six, ESV. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. I said you are gods and sons of the Most High, all of you. And we went up and down every way I could go on that text to show you this is obviously a supernatural text. It indicates that there are these beings that are called gods, but they are not, they do not hold the attributes of Yahweh. Yahweh is the personal name of God. Elohim is the more generic name. Yahweh is the name that was delivered to Moses at the burning bush. Who do I tell them that sent me? The response is Yahweh sent you. The text here though is talking about Elohim. And as I mentioned to you, it's used several times here. It can be plural and it can be singular. And so the language here is very clear. God has taken his stand in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. I said you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. This is clearly the divine counsel. The sons of the Most High is synonymous with the sons of God. Psalm 89, 5 and 7, we'll deal with that in a moment, explicitly situates the sons of God in Yahweh's counsel. Consequently, the sons of God or sons of the Most High are not men. It is more coherent and biblically consistent to read sons of God as supernatural beings as elsewhere in the Old Testament. Let's pick it up again. Psalm 89, beginning at verse 5. The heavens will praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness also in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies is comparable to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty is like the Lord? a God greatly feared in the council of the holy ones and awesome above all those who are around him. There is a fundamental flaw in viewing these marriages at the outset as being polygamous. One must read that into the text. It may be in view, but it's not clear. The language is imprecise. The relevant phrase here in Genesis 6, 2 states, they took for themselves women, the language is a sexual euphemism in both verse two and verse four for a description of these sons of God taking and entering, that's the language, quote, taking, quote, entering, simply means sexual intercourse. The text is making the point that the sons of God had sexual relationships with human women and not that they were necessarily marrying them. 
Now, believers are called sons of God in a few times in the New Testament, but this fact does not support the aristocracy position. In other words, they'll go and they'll look at that and they'll say, well, we think this is about humans. And in the New Testament, it talks about humans being called sons of God, so obviously that must equate here. I laid out the case that sons of God are human to the, re to the seen world, and these sons of God image God to the unseen realm. But most importantly, the divine human king view does not take into account the testimony of 1 Peter, of 2 Peter, and Jude. We will look at those texts down the road. Further explanation will come later. The most coherent view, coherent view of the New Testament passages is that they are interacting with Genesis chapter 6 and the intertestamental writings from the books of Jubilees, Enoch, Book of the Giants, Dead Sea Scrolls. That's naturalistic view number one. Yes. Steve. I'm going to repeat it for the sake of the... Does that work? Yeah, we got it working. Oh, well, this is great. Okay. Okay. We're talking about the spiritual sons of God, and then we're talking about the human sons of God. Since spiritual beings are not composed of flesh, how can these people, spiritual people, have intercourse with people that are flesh? Okay. I will deal with that. <laughs> I think it's a great question, I, but I've got to take one thing at one time, okay? That's a great question that gets into the whole issue of you know, how physical are they. We'll talk about that. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm not tonight, but we will. We will cover all that. Anybody else? Question? It was the same question. Same question. Okay. It's a good question. They're, they're interpreting the text. Taking. Oh, taking. Okay. It okay. also says taken as wives. Taking them as wives. It's, they're interpreting the text. Okay. All right. The dominant view, though, among evangelical churches and evangelical scholars and reform scholars is the Sethite view. Hands down. As noted earlier, this position asserts that the godly line of Seth intermarried with the ungodly line of Cain. This view is a continuation of the two seed conflict going back to Genesis 3.15. You might remember when, the, when Adam and Eve sin, right? God comes into the garden, Adam and Eve hide themselves, God confronts them. He starts with Adam, Adam passes the buck to the woman, the woman passes the buck down to Satan, and then the judgment goes exactly the opposite direction. It starts with the serpent, goes to the woman, then goes to the man. The judgment of the serpent, we have this hope that's given, and this very dark time, that there's nothing good <laughs> in that text, except one glimmer of hope. Verse 15. You know, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And you shall bruise him on the heel and he shall crush your head. Okay? So what Genesis 3.15 is basically saying, you're only going to have two kinds of people on the planet. It's not going to matter what their nationality is. What matters is, is... Spiritually, you have the lovers of God and essentially the haters of God. That's it. The Sethite view basically is arguing there is, as this develops, a physical lineage here. And I would argue in, a, in agreement with part of that. I, I think that there is. Generally speaking, the Sethite line seems to be the godly line. If you follow the line of Cain, they become city dwellers. They, they become, they're involved in metallurgy. They're involved in the arts. They're, they're advancing in music and dancing and various kinds of things. The other ones, the, uh, the, uh, the, um, 
yeah, Seth, but the, the Canaanite line, the Cain line, they're building cities and naming them after themselves. The other ones, they don't have any cities. There's no named, they're not named after them. They just kind of fade off into nothing, you know, but they're calling on the Lord. So they're following that. That's generally that idea. So what they then, they take that and they say, well, this was hard and fast between those two lines, and then what we've got here in Genesis 6 is a continuation of it. Where did this come from? Well, long before Calvin's contempt for the supernatural view, the first theologian that spoke of the Sethite view was Julius Africanus, 160 to 240 AD. That's the first writing we have of this. The second one that came along of note was John Chrysostom, 347 to 407. But what really caused it to grow was the writing of St. Augustine. Augustine, his dates 354 to 430. In 410, he publishes what is arguably a magnum opus there, the city of God. And it's in the city of God, he talks about the development. It's the city of man and the city of God. Okay, it's the idea of city of Cain and the city of Seth. It's the godly line and the ungodly line. There's a lot in there that's very valuable, I, 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 I would agree with. For although the former were, and I'm, I'm quoting now, by these two names, this is Augustine, by these two names, sons of God and daughters of men, the two cities are sufficiently distinguished. For although the former were by nature children of men, they had come into possession of another name by grace. When they, the godly race, were captivated by the daughters of men, they adopted the manners of the earthly to win them as their brides and forsook the godly ways they had followed in their holy society. All right. That's Augustine. What I want to do now is I want to make arguments against this position. First of all, Nowhere in Scripture is the line of Seth ever referred to as the sons of God. The seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman motif are in play, but the text is more about spirituality than physical lineage. In other words, was every single person in the Seth line godly and everyone in the Canaanite line, were they all ungodly? That's highly unlikely. Were all the daughters of men evil? While the Sethite line, the sons of God, they were all godly based on lineage alone. Look on the screen, Genesis 4, verse 26. To Seth, to him also, a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. Then man began to call upon the name of the Lord. Now this text does not say it was the people from the line of Seth who called upon the name of the Lord, even though Lamech, if you kept reading it, and Enosh are obviously spiritual opposites. This verse does not support the idea that everyone in each line followed rank. Think about election as it came down through the patriarchs. So, you know, we had, for example, you have Isaac and Ishmael. Both of them had the right dad, okay? But Ishmael was out, and Isaac was in. Or a little bit later, you've got Jacob and Esau. In that case, they both have the right dad, and they have the right mother. Esau was out. Jacob was in. I don't think it's lineage here as far as physicality. Tim Chaffee makes an interesting observation on this. He says, quote, In verse 1, we are told that when men multiplied on the earth, daughters were born to them. So who were the daughters in this verse? They were the girls born to the men who were multiplying on the earth. Chapter 4, verse 26. There is no textual justification for thinking that these men were limited to one family line or form a special class. And then he further makes this note, and I think this is of, of, of uh, importance. He notes the inconsistency of changing the meaning of the term man in verse, <clears throat> uh, 
uh, the, the meaning of man here. Here's what he says. The Sethi position changes the reference to the daughters of all men in verse 1 to the daughters of some men, namely those of Cain's line in verse 2. The problem is that now they've interpreted man in a general way in verse 1, a particular way in verse 2, and then again in a general way again in verse 3. I checked this out. Derek Kidner in his commentary, the Tyndall Old Testament commentaries, he made the same observation. There's games being played here with the way the term man is being used. Furthermore, note what often goes unnoticed in this text. In the Sethite view, we are told that the Sethites are only godly. Then we're supposed to accept that in Noah's day, all of the godly line abandoned true religion for unbridled lust. No one prior to that time rebelled. Then everyone in Noah's day did rebel. If you think about it carefully, the strange thing about this view is it's the godly line, the Sethites, are the ones committing the wickedness in the passage. I mean, you think it would be the other way around. It would be the daughters of men who were dressing provocatively. They seduced these men. They brought them into the wickedness they were coming from. But in this way, it's the godly line that's doing it. It is even possible to understand the taking of wives in 6.2 to be a violent action against these women. The same language is used of Abimelech, you remember the situation that existed there, that pagan king with Sarah, chapter 20, verse 2. The idea of taking her was not put in a positive light. Same term is also used of Shechem, who took Dinah. The scene was violent, Genesis 34. Are we to believe that all the good men are suddenly acting wickedly, while all the daughters of men are suddenly acting wickedly as well? I mean, Douglas Van Doren makes that comment. There were Sethites who were not godly. For example, we know from chapter 5, verse 30, that Noah had brothers and sisters, but they were probably not among, they were probably among the wicked that were destroyed in the flood. Well, weren't they descendants of Seth? Of course they were. Note also that the Bible never refers to Seth as among the sons of God, just as nowhere is Cain ever called a son of Adam. And in addition, the Bible never identifies the people from Seth's lineage with the descriptive phrase, sons of God. The only way that is interpreted, the only way that is used, the Old Testament text where we've looked at it, or the text where the Hebrew is very similar, sons of the mighty, it all has a supernatural understanding of it. Finally, we note that Adam and Eve had other children. How does the Sethi position account for this point? Genesis chapter 5, verse 4. Then the days of Adam, after he became the father of Seth, were 800 years. And he had other sons and daughters. There would have been other lines besides Cain's line. So if it's a hard and fast physical lineage, it doesn't work. Now I ask this question. Why is the supernatural view frowned on? Well, some of it has to do with Steve's point. It sounds incredulous for us to think in these terms. Perhaps the largest objection to the fallen sons of God view are Christians' emotional responses. We tend to have a recoiling about this. It's offensive to us. Robert Duncan Culver, a systematic, theologi systematic theology professor, he taught at Wheaton College, also taught at Trinity Divinity School in Chicago. Mainstream evangelical. He writes... The minds of most educated people today recoil against such apparent superstition. Yet the same is true of all the teachings of the Scripture about angels and other important subjects like 
miracles, the incarnation, the second advent. Such an incursion cannot on principle be ruled out as preposterous. Some of the most sober writers in the history of biblical interpretation have thought that Genesis 6, 1 to 4, does indeed describe such an incursion and that it was one of the causes of the judgment of the flood. An incursion of the divine unseen realm into the scene. Add to that, on the screen, Willem van Gieren, Westminster Theological Journal, pretty, pretty reformed, here we go. Why does the theology in which creation, miracles, the miraculous birth, the resurrection of Jesus have a place prefer a rational explanation of Genesis 6, 1 to 4? Evangelical writers proffer instead of an angelic, demonic, intermarriage view, the view that the sons of God are the Sethites and the daughters of man are descendants of the line of Cain or variations of the intermarriage of these two classes of human beings. Why do evangelicals prefer the view of the intermarriage of humans in whatever variety it may be found? And it's interesting to me that Augustine who really set this out and put it out there in the city of God, and in many ways is very good, but even he too, in the city of God, has this quote. There it is on the screen. There is, too, a very general rumor which may have verified by their own experience or which trustworthy persons who have heard the experiences of other corroborate that sylvans and fawns who are commonly called incubi had often made wicked assaults upon women and satisfied their lust upon them and that certain devils called deuces by the Gauls are constantly attempting and affecting this impurity is so generally affirmed that it were imprudent to deny it." End quote. So in the same book, Augustine is saying these four categories, sylvans, fawns, incubi, and deuces, all names for demonic entities, that there are reports of this going on. And it's so prolific and validated in many places, it would be imprudent to deny it. At his, at his time period. At his time period. Okay? Four something? 410. 410. Now, listen. The seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent motif is in play here. Again, Genesis 3, verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the, field, on the, on the heel. There is a conflict here between the two, no doubt about it. If the seed of the serpent could annihilate the seed of the woman then the promised one would never come. Now think about it. What happens in chapter 4? What's the first thing that happens in chapter 4 of Genesis? Does Cain kill Abel in 4? Cain kills Abel. Okay? The first murder happens in chapter 4. This becomes the theme of the entire Old Testament. Why is it that the Jews, it's always the fourth quarter, they're down by six touchdowns, it's two minutes to go, and somehow God pulls them through. They're on the precipice of disaster all of the time. You've got a final solution that predated Nazi Germany happening all the way back in the book of Esther. Why is that? Kill them. Annihilate them. This this is a primary thrust of the powers of darkness. Destroy, annihilate the seed of the woman, and then the promised one who would crush Satan's head will never come. However, 
the seed of the serpent developed an additional battle plan. Now, in a military context, if you have an army that's going in to repossess land that's been taken by a foe, those military advisors, those, those planners, they gotta know, they gotta know maps, they gotta know where the cities are, they gotta know where the valleys are, where the mountains are, and they gotta know where the rivers are. And they have to know where the bridges are. Because you gotta have those bridges not only to get your army across, to keep advancing and taking more territory, but you also have to have your supply lines that's gonna keep your army intact. You gotta have those bridges. So then, military analysts will ask the question, what's the best way to take a bridge? Answer, assault both sides at the same time. The reason is, if you float people across that river and you assault both sides at the same time, you have less of a chance that the opposing army will destroy the bridge as they retreat. It's a two-pronged attack. What I'm suggesting to you is, in regards to the seed of the woman, the seed of the serpent, is that there is a two-pronged objective. The serpent strategy has this idea. A would be annihilate the seed. And we see that on the pages of Scripture everywhere but to buttress it, a second plan, a second objective. Pollute the seed of the woman with serpentine seed. Now this will be made clear as we continue on in our study and we see the purity of the line of the Lord Jesus Christ there would be no serpentine seed to get there. Either kill it, would be the battle cry, or amalgamate it, that is, to combine or unite with it. So the next lectures will provide rationale for further justification of the supernatural view. What I'm gonna provide for you in the upcoming weeks is this. I went back through my records. In 1991, I stood up here for a Sunday school class and was teaching the book of Genesis and was up with, again, with this text. And what I said at the time was, well, there are these different views, you know? You got this supernatural view that's in there, you know, but it's a little hard to get, it's a hard pill to get down, you know? So I kind of think it's Seth, it's a Seth view here, it makes sense, we can see that. But I don't know if I could dismiss this completely. What I wanna do is walk you through the research that I've done to put this class together and show you how I move from being, it might be true, to it is absolutely true. And when you see it, all of a sudden, that passage makes sense, and that makes sense, and this makes sense, and that over here fits. It starts coming together in ways we probably didn't think about in the past. Remember though, it's the backstory. It's the backstory. We're talking about puzzle pieces and making them fit. Now, my wife is a great puzzle person. Okay? Deidre is a pit bull when it comes to puzzles. She likes to get them. They have eight million pieces. You know, a million wouldn't be enough. You gotta have eight. You know. She gets them all out there, and that's not enough. Then you gotta get these ones where it has a midnight sky, where a, over a third of the puzzle, there is all the same color. You can get in there. She'll welcome you to help, then get out of her way. So you go back and look at that after several days and you can see the picture. Oh, I see this here. Yeah, I can make out the whole thing. I got it. But there's a few pieces that are missing. Maybe out of that midnight sky. You could not put those pieces in 
and still understand everything about the picture because everything else is highlighted. That's the way it is with the scripture. The story of man's redemption is the story of the Bible cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation. That's the story. But what we're studying is the backstory. And there are pieces in that midnight blue sky that really do fit. And when you see it, you have the whole picture. I noted for you at the beginning of this course that one of my objectives was to carry on for you the idea of wonderment and awe for God. You know, that the God of the universe is this big. I mean, he has all of these things going on at the same time and still working on his plan as he has seen fit. But I want to introduce to you another objective tonight, which concerns the idea of holiness. Holiness. That awe and wonder carries with it the concern for the sovereignty of God and how great he is. But listen to this. This is the Apostle Peter writing here. And he says to us, 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 15. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Being holy means policing our eyes. And all the Covenant Eyes employees, you know, you all, you all have that down, right? I want you in the upcoming week to meditate on this phrase. The sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful. I'll shorten it for you. That the sons of God saw the sons of God saw. In my view, this is the first sexual sin noted in the scripture. Now, I'm sure sexual sin, along with all other sins, were happening before we got to chapter 6 of Genesis. But this is highlighted. The sons of God saw. I want you to meditate on this point because sin that is birthed in the body comes by way of the eyes. David saw a woman bathing. Remember the story? We are now living in the age of voyeurism. We see many, many things. Thomas Manton, the Puritan, wrote, look to your eyes. Much sin comes in by the eye. The eye tempts the fancy, and the fancy works on the heart. The sons of God saw I want you to meditate on that, and I want you now to correlate that, that the next time you're tempted to be looking at something you're not supposed to be looking at, ask yourself this question. What stands behind the temptation? I think as we move forward in this class, there's a greater sensitivity to the sense of temptation as it relates, relates to our lives before the Lord. What power or powers, what is standing behind the temptation? You know, I told Dieter the other day, maybe it's today, you know, I have this, just this Amazon 10 tablet, okay? And I didn't ask for it, but Amazon then puts up all these advertisements for everything that Amazon's doing that they want you to get involved with, right? 
And they've got their own movies that they want to get you involved in as well. And some of them are free. They're freebies, you know, you watch them with commercials. They are some of the vilest things you can possibly think of. I mean, the one I just saw yesterday, I brought it to her attention, it has to, it, the whole thing is about masturbation. The whole thing. I mean, it just comes right there. I mean, it's just coming across, you know, I didn't click on it, it just is, there it is. It's the age of voyeurism. Much sin comes by way of the eyes. The eye tempts the fancy, and the fancy works on the heart. Psalm 103. Excuse me, 101, 3 and 4. I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not fasten its grip on me. I think there's something here. It's not just sexual sin. It's all the things my neighbor has that I don't have. There's all kinds of lust. There's all kinds of coveting. It comes by way of the eye. The sons of God saw. I want you to get like a bathtub in your mind and sit on that in it and meditate on that. As we push further into this study, watch for the greater sensitivity concerning the nature of temptation and what stands behind it. What I want you to see is there are things that are ugly. They're ungodly that are behind the very things you're being tempted to look at. The sons of God saw. They do the same things with us. they done with themselves. Now, I grant you, this sounds really sick. You know, it sounds perverted. You know, Steve has a good question here, like, how is this even possible? We're going to work, try to work through all that. But first of all, I want you to understand, it may be the minority position, but it's changing. And it's changing because there's too much other evidences to corroborate this. And I will lay out over the next several weeks the reasons for why I've gotten to the point to say, this is exactly what happened. And it's a story about how God preserved the seed of the woman. So that the he that we all worship on Sunday morning that set us free from our sin was not annihilated, nor was he polluted. It's a divine act. In brief, what we're going to be looking at is an unholy mixture. The Old Testament, particularly in the Pentateuch, has a lot to say about things that are unholy. And in most cases, it has to do with mixing the common with that which is holy. This is a case of an unholy mixture. And while you're meditating on this idea of the sons of God saw, I want you to think about your own life regarding holiness and how there might be areas of your life where there's been an unholy mixture. Maybe through the music that you like. Maybe through the entertainment that you like. Maybe in the books that you like to read. Maybe in the people that you hang around with. And then think, what was behind all of those temptations? Something so hideous, so incredibly ugly, that if you ever had eyes to see, you'd be terrified of. It's only God's mercy that he shields us from these things. The sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful. We're going to unpack it in spades in the next several weeks. But I'm going to largely give you the evidence that I've been able to come up with that I said, this, this is it. This is what happened. All right, any questions? Any comments?
everybody's speechless. <laughs> Karen, Karen. Yeah, she's coming. So I think this is fascinating, and I, I totally agree with what you're saying, but it also gives us a very deep insight to things that are happening in the world, and this revelation of the evil is actually showing its face more and more. Yeah, evil is, you know, technology has helped to progress it, obviously, uh, and we're moving towards something. I assume it's towards God's end and design, you know, but it is becoming more evil. Because people, like people in Hollywood, are, are openly revealing that they're Satanists. Yeah. I mean, they dress like them, they talk like them, they make symbols like them. I mean, it's pretty ugly. Anyone else? Um, <clears throat> yeah. In Augustine. Yep. In Augustine, they say there's a general rumor that verified experiences such as, well, I can't pronounce them all, but incubi. Yeah. They were supposed to be um, from somewhere. And <clears throat> I would assume that these are, have to be, they have to be, got with women, that might have to be of flesh. Yeah. And I'll, well, let me say this to you, because you asked this question, I'll get into this much more later on. Number one, when we have a being that is divine, that appears within Scripture, both Old and New Testaments, number one, they're always in a male form. A man appeared. A man, two men appeared over here. You look at the Scripture, it's always male. You never see it any other way. Number two, we also know that they eat, they drink, they rest, they laid hands on Lot and dragged him out of the city. They were very physical, okay? So I can't, I will not be able to explain how exactly they did that, but nonetheless, it seems as though God has allowed them to do that. Now, so would you consider this to be offsprings of Satan? Who? The incubi. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And what we will be studying is, what is the other rationale for the Nephilim? Okay, I'm gonna, we're going to go into history at the time, Israel's neighbors, and we're going to find this is not weird. All kinds of people knew about this outside of Israel and wrote about it. Okay? That's what's coming. Right over here. So these are not angels that we're talking about. Really. The, so. the, these are, in my view, they are sons of God right. that are part of the divine council and have fallen. Okay. And angels, aren't they asexual? Okay, so what I'm saying is, you would think they would be, yeah. but when we see them in Scripture, they always appear as men. Okay. Well, Gabriel, Michael, they That's true, names. yeah. They all men's names. I mean, Jesus came, when yeah. Abraham sees him coming, he came with two men. You know? <laughs> I mean, they're obviously divine, okay. but they're always referred to as males for some reason. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Even angels are not asexual, so people can't be either. Now listen, now listen, I just... Yeah. Sorry. What did she say? Even angels are not asexual. Even angels have uh, sex, you know, a gender. <laughs> so oh, humans, so man cat, yes. humans definitely they do. They're not trans. They're trans. Yeah, okay. They may not be trans, but they transgressed the barrier between the unseen and the seen realm. And what we are going to find is there is a curse brought down from God on this that is unlike anything else that we'll see in Scripture. Yes, Sue. Do you remember those books that came out by Frank Peretti, This Present Darkness? I mean, that's, that's like exactly what you're talking about. I mean, he just, he just, the way he wrote, just visualized it. To me, that's, 
what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know that he got into actual procreation. I don't remember that. No, but the but, no, but the beings, beings being, being that, yes. Yes. Now, these come to my mind as I've been going over this class. I'm trying to sensitize you that as we get into this more and more, the next time when you walk out of here, by the time you go home, you're going to be tempted to do something. And a lot of that temptation is coming by virtue of the eyes. The sons of God saw. I want you to meditate on that in the age of voyeurism to recognize what is behind that which you're seeing and being tempted to do. Remember, the ploy that was used with Adam and Eve was Satan had a better idea. In other words, put it this way. The restriction that was put on Adam and Eve indicated that the best for Adam and Eve was being declined by God. The whole idea of the temptation is this is better. Every single temptation in your life comes with that kind of an idea. This will be better for you. You're being denied something. Sons of God saw. See? So there is a, certainly for sexual sin, there is an equivalence here, but I think it's broader than that in regards to all of the sin that comes into our lives. Okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we close our time together this evening, we've, we've covered some very startling kinds of things. And for those of us that maybe haven't looked at this in the past, it's, it's, <laughs> we're overwhelmed. I understand that. I've had those days myself. So Lord, we just turn to you and we pray that you'd continue to guide us and direct us as we walk through this study. We want to know what does the word of God say? What does it say and what does it mean to us now? What did it mean then and how do we apply it in our lives now? So we turn to you and ask for your continued blessing as we assemble once again next week. In Jesus' name, amen. See you then.